Thank you for joining us at tonight's, for tonight's educational webinar on foot pain. Our tonight's speaker is Dr. Ralph Napolitano, orthoneuropodiatrist and wound care specialist. Dr. Napolitano is a double board certified podiatrist and wound care physician specializing in conservative treatments, surgery, and wound care of the foot, ankle, and lower leg. He was the first podiatrist in the state of Ohio to earn the board certification of certified wound specialist physician. His areas of special clinical interest include medical and surgical foot care and foot and ankle care, general foot, um, general wound care and healing, diabetic foot wounds, lower limb surgical salvage, management of surgical wound complications, custom foot orthotics, gait analysis, aesthetic podiatry, and laser care. Dr. Napolitano will answer questions following his presentation. Please type your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Dr. Napolitano? Thank you very much, Heather. Uh, appreciate everyone's time tonight. So the first part is to make sure everything is online and I, I think we're online. Um, I appreciate uh, the introduction. Uh, our group, we're a multi-specialty orthopedic and neurology practice based here in central Ohio. And I'd love to say this is what Columbus looks like behind me, but uh, I, I don't think anyone would believe that. So uh, tonight's presentation is my feet hurt. Why? Well, we're going to talk about it. So my specialty is that branch of medicine devoted to the study, diagnosis, and medical and surgical treatment of disorders of the foot, ankle, and lower extremity. So at OrthoNeuro, we approach the lower extremity like a body region, not just an organ system. So I'm kind of like special teams in our group. And interestingly, in Ohio, we have retained a small part of our chiropody heritage. And what that means is we're able to treat superficial problems of the hand, okay, such as nail disorders or warts on the hand. This goes back a long way, uh, ancient times. So Hippocrates described foot care, treating corns and calluses, and Napoleon and President Lincoln had foot care at the hands of a podiatrist as well. Uh, in 1895, uh, the first uh, study, or I should say the first society of podiatrists was established in uh, New York City. Other uh, countries followed and our specialty came onto its own. So the fabulous foot, we uh, I think underappreciate our feet. Uh, they do a lot for us. They keep us uh, moving along life's journey, whatever that may be. A uh, few facts, uh, each foot has 33 joints, 100 tendons, 26 muscles, and so on. And feet perspire, okay, half a pint of perspiration daily from their 250,000 sweat glands. In average, a person will walk our earth four times in a lifetime. It's a lot of steps. If you think about a foot problem being uh, something you can't escape, it, it really is because we, we take how many of these steps in a day, a week, a month, a year, a lot, okay? Uh, women experience foot problems four, four times more than men, and perhaps that's related to the shoes that they wear. Now, men, of course, need to watch uh, their shoe gear choice as well, but perhaps there's a correlation here. So we have to take care of these feet. We have uh, two pair and 10 toes. So this is a huge topic. Uh, certainly, uh, we, could, we could talk for the next week plus on all the things that could go wrong nonstop, but what we're going to do is kind of address some common things I've seen in my 20 years of practice, how we, we treat such problems and how to care for these, uh, these feet of ours, these marvels of engineering, so we don't get these problems in the first place. Now, we're not going to get into trauma in detail. Uh, we'll leave that for another discussion and my other partners. Some of you might recognize this gentleman. He was famous for his uh, top 10 list. We'll uh, drill things down to just top six common foot problems that I see. Okay, so number one, okay, why do my feet hurt with nail fungus? Well, we'll talk about it. So nail fungus and athlete's foot, this is our first broad category. Uh, we'll, we'll start with nail fungus here. Half of Americans will be, be diagnosed with nail fungus by the age 70. It's caused by common microscopic fungal organisms for, found throughout our environment. Uh, nail thickening, nail deformity, nail discoloration, foul odor, et cetera. So if your nail is uh, rather deformed, trying to get that in a shoe, certainly that's going to be uncomfortable. Uh, that can lead to some other problems that we'll get into today. Uh, of special concern is fungal nail problems with folks with diabetes, circulatory issues, or immune compromise. And left untreated, what can happen is the nail can get damaged beyond repair. 
So this is what uh, this problem looks like, okay? Uh, a milder type presentation to something more significant at the bottom. And even affect fingernails as well, but definitely much more common in the feet. The uh, foot lives in a cool, moist, uh, damp environment, and this lends itself uh, to the perfect breeding ground for, for nail fungus, okay? So how do we treat uh, this, this scourge? Uh, oral antifungals, antibiotics, okay, for fungal organisms, just like antibiotics target bacterial infections. We'll, we'll get into some caveats with uh, oral antifungals here in a minute. Topicals, all right, nail lacquers, polishes, et cetera, that are clear medicines, uh, prescription, as well as over-the-counter. Uh, laser therapy. So all of these things can work in concert. Now, with respect to oral medications, they have the propensity to be a little bit hard on the liver. So those of us that are on uh, cholesterol lowering medications or certain other medications that can predispose to liver issues, we have to be careful. Okay. As we get older, the body metabolizes such medicines a little bit slower. So we have to enter that treatment plan cautiously. Topicals, completely safe they're not always uh, the most efficacious, okay? So uh, when you think about what the medicine has to do to penetrate that thick uh, nail uh, keratin uh, plate that it is, there's a lot that has to go on pharmacologically. Now laser, uh, lasers in medicine have been around for several years, everything from hair removal to uh, intraoperative techniques to scar reduction to laser. And what we have found is in combination, a couple therapies work in concert to give us this synergistic approach that uh, can be uh, very beneficial. So whether it's laser, uh, we offer this at OrthoNeuro, uh, whether it's topical, whether it's oral, uh, a combination uh, of a couple therapies certainly uh, can help. And we've also found certainly, and this uh, makes sense, the earlier you can catch this problem, uh, the more beneficial early therapy and intervention is to clear this. So prevention, going barefoot excessively in public spaces, uh, gym shower floors, et cetera. Now pools, that environment where uh, feet tend to be spread out and uh, walking around, um, it's not as a concern versus smaller spaces that may not be as um, hygienic. So your kids going off to college, uh, your high school athletes, it's a little bit of uh, awareness, if you will. So basic foot hygiene and nail care, uh, taking care of your feet, washing them, things that are um, obvious. But uh, again, we tend to neglect our feet. We go about our day and we don't necessarily think about what we need to do uh, with our feet. Uh, pedicure awareness. And what I mean by this, uh, certainly uh, nail salons, um, spas, et cetera, they have to adhere to the state medical board and the cosmetology board. So certainly uh, there's checks and balances uh, in place, uh, but it, honestly, if uh, you go into an establishment and it doesn't feel right to you, it, it probably isn't. So um, certainly uh, a pleasure is the Whirlpool Spa Pedicure. Uh, there, you do incur some risk in um, undergoing such care, not that it can't be done. It's just to, uh, something that you need to uh, be a little bit cognizant of, a little bit of extra caution afterwards, et cetera, and, and ask uh, the staff. At uh, OrthoNeuro, uh, we, we support uh, shoe health and not just foot health. So when I talk to my patients, we talk about shoe and sock health, where your feet live, certainly very important. So taking care of your shoes, um, those of you that have shoe trees, that's certainly a good practice to do. Cedar wood shoe trees help absorb perspiration when you're done wearing your shoes for the day. There's products that use UV light. UV light's getting a lot of uh, uh, publicity today in light of uh, our current uh, state of affairs regarding sanitization. They sell such things that uh, sanitize shoes, sprays uh, specific, or even just simply antiseptic sprays, Lysol, et cetera. Uh, sock choice, socks that have a little bit of acrylic, tend to be moisture wicking uh, versus just straight up uh, cotton. Uh, merino wool is a nice uh, wicking uh, blend. So socks with uh, combination materials are certainly helpful uh, to uh, prevent uh, excess moisture uh, in your shoes. 
Moving on, athlete's foot. So our second uh, fungal infection, still topic one here, like onychomycosis, which is a term for nail fungus, it's caused by common types of microscopic fungal organisms throughout our environment. Uh, signs and symptoms, uh, dry scaling skin, cracks, blisters, et cetera. Uh, more advanced cases, you can get what we call a polymicrobial infection, where you have a super infection of bacteria with fungus. And this is, again, a concern with diabetic patients, folks with circulatory deficits, or people with uh, immune compromise. Now, important to point out, uh, onychomycosis can be a reservoir for tinea pedis and vice versa. So this is what this presentation looks like, okay? Uh, also a very common uh, foot ailment, cracking, blistering, itching, et cetera. So similar treatments, okay, oral medications. However, this will be a shorter course compared to nail fungus, okay? Fungal creams, ointments, often in combination with a steroid can be helpful. Uh, we talk shoe health again uh, to prevent uh, such problems. I, I tell patients, your lawn shoes, those are good for a season, okay? We don't want to be wearing shoes to mow the lawn for season after season after season. Um, you can maybe get away with a couple seasons, but think about what you're doing. Think about that environment that they're in and what your feet are going to then live in, okay? So prevention, again, similar, avoiding going uh, excessively barefoot in public spaces. Uh, so when you're traveling, think about flip-flops. Uh, any body of water, again, to and from, but wherever you have a larger uh, amount of real estate per se, there isn't that uh, significant concentration of bare feet walking throughout. Uh, basic foot hygiene, uh, essentially, you know, again, a celebration of the obvious, if you will, uh, but drying your feet thoroughly uh, between your toes. Uh, if you uh, have excessive uh, perspiration, controlling that moisture, it's a condition called hyperhidrosis. There's products for that. There's medications shoe and sock health again, and uh, pedicure awareness, uh, if you will. Parlaying into uh, topic number two, ingrown toenails. So uh, that deformed toenail, that uh, fungal toenail can cause some pinching into the skin. We call this condition onychocryptosis or a perinicia, which the nail curves in causing pressure and pain on the surrounding nail tissue. It may even puncture the skin resulting in an infection. This can be caused by a traumatic injury or chronic uh, left over time or, or seen over time from a nail uh, deformity. A little bit of nail anatomy here. So we're talking most commonly about the uh, lateral and medial nail folds. So the inside of a toe versus the outside of the toe. And uh, the great toe <clears throat> is most commonly affected because of the anatomy and because of how our feet are put together and simply our gait pattern. As we walk, we start on the outside of our heel and finish off toeing off on the inside of the great toe. Sometimes we see a perinicky or nail infection distally, where that distal portion of the nail plows into that soft tissue on the end, or even a proximal nail fold infection as well. But most commonly, it's the great toes, and most commonly, it's the sides, medial, lateral, or both. Okay, so this is what this looks like. I experienced this for the first time when I was nine years old and a family friend that was an early influence on my career took care of this for me. Uh, if it curves around excessively, we call that a, a ram's horn nail or a trumpet nail, okay? So how we treat this, uh, we remove the offending border either temporarily or permanently. We do lots of this at OrthoNeuro, uh, depending on the severity and chronicity of the problem. This uh, is something that can be corrected permanently in which that border is taken out surgically and a medicine is applied to prevent the nail from growing back. It's very effective, very tried and true procedure that we do right in the office. It's kind of like going to the dentist, except it's for your toe. It's done under local and uh, recuperation is uh, very minimal. It doesn't require suturing regarding uh, getting back to your activities and sugar, usually a couple days, you're slightly uncomfortable and then uh, off you go to normal life. Uh, if you were talking about an infection, again, antibiotics, oral and topical, uh, taking care of the surgical sites, um, depending on how we do what we do uh, to kill the nail root, uh, going back to uh, that um, procedure. Most often we use a chemical called phenol you can do this a little bit more involved where you surgically excise the matrix, uh, where you work closer to 
the phalanx bone, if you will, but we don't ever get into the bone. That's a more of a surgical matricectomy versus a chemical matricectomy. Matricectomy is that term to uh, ablate that nail root. Uh, regarding trimming your own toenails, or if you're getting them done professionally, avoid excessive rounding, because if you round them too much, you're pr prone to have that uh, nail plate as it grows out, plow into the side of the nail folds on either side. Tight shoes, uh, certainly that pointy toe box, high heel. Uh, biomechanically, that's not good for a lot of reasons. Um, excessively, everything in moderation, if you will, but squeezing toes into tight shoes certainly uh, is going to set yourself up for this problem. Okay. Uh, foot and toe deformities. Again, a gargantuan topic here. We're going to sort of stick to the front of the foot where uh, things are more commonly seen uh, or more obvious, if you will. Uh, a bunion, We'll start with that topic first is a deformity of the great toe joint in which the toe turns in and the first metatarsal head is more prominent. So that turns out, if you will, or out and independent. We'll show you pictures here in a minute. This is a result of an imbalance between the tendons and ligaments that help keep the great toe in line. Okay. And when those go awry, we have excessive pulling. Uh, one way or the other, that can cause disruption at that joint, causing the great toe uh, joint to get out of uh, biomechanical sync. Now, regarding uh, men uh, and women, women are more prone to this condition, not necessarily just because of the shoes, but because of foot structure. So their joints tend to be a little bit more rounded versus uh, the male anatomy tends to be a little bit more square. So Women are more prone to uh, subluxation, which is a term in which that joint becomes unstable and we see a bunion, versus compression and arthritic change. So uh, arthritis, wear and tear, we will touch on that uh, a bit later. So uh, flatter foot type versus a higher arch foot. So also something that we see regarding foot and uh, toe deformities, a flatter foot type, uh, rough analogy is it's like a floppy bag of bones. It doesn't function uh, the most stiffly. And this tends to lend itself to that term subluxation in which the great toe joint again turns in. Uh, a higher arch foot, okay, is more like a rigid lever. And that foot is more prone to arthritic change, more wear and tear. This is what this condition looks like. You have your great toe joint on the right with that joint capsule uh, in which we have this imbalance of the tendons and ligaments and joint capsule out of sync, which that metatarsal head turns in causing the great toe uh, to turn the other way in and out respectively, however you'd like to uh, file that in, in your memory. Um, the, the real technical term for this when more pronounced is called hallux abducto valgus, in which the great toe actually turns over, so it tilts. So if you look at someone with a bad bunion, not only is the toe pointing inward and the metatarsal is pointing outward, the toe is actually rotated. And this is a, a severe deformity that certainly uh, needs addressed and you would appreciate fitting that in a shoe is, is difficult. Here's some clinical presentations, more mild to severe. You can even have the lucky toe syndrome or, or perhaps the unlucky toe syndrome, in which you have a crossover deformity where the lesser toes cross over the big toe or the big toe crosses over the lesser toes. Difficult, certainly, uh, to walk, difficult to fit into shoe gear. Early stage on the left, you can appreciate where that would also be a little bit more difficult to, to fit in shoes. Now, also to point out, perhaps asymptomatic, uh, maybe the patient on the left without shoes, okay? Uh, when you're wearing shoe gear, that's when you're kind of noticing this for the first time. You might have some arthritic change underneath all that, that's early stage. And again, if we catch this early enough, prevention is worth a pound of cure, okay? Radiographs here, again, more severe on the right. You can appreciate that that toe joint, um, that second toe joint where that uh, phalanx bone is actually overriding the metatarsal and sticking up in the air. This takes uh, not just a couple months, but years to develop. So how do we treat this? Well, early stage uh, shoe gear and activity modification, trying to reverse uh, what, what has been done uh, for inflamed bunions, anti-inflammatories, pain creams, et cetera. 
uh, surgery is really the only way to put uh, these deformities uh, or to correct these deformities and to put the foot back in alignment. Okay. There are many, many surgical options to fix a bunion. This is showing just one uh, simple example. You can operate on the gray toe joint more distally. You can do this in combination with operating on the metatarsal more proximally, meaning closer to the middle of the foot uh, or in combination as you'll see here in a minute. So here's one example of a more simpler bunion surgery in which that metatarsal head is essentially cut, fractured, if you will, and moved over and fixated with a single screw, okay? Um, prevention, again, wearing the right size shoes of good quality, uh, avoiding shoes with a narrow toe box and excessively high heels. With that high heel, not only are you uh, disrupting the biomechanics in the front of the foot, but you're also causing contracture of your heel cord okay, the Achilles. So over time, that shortened heel cord lends itself to uh, lots of biomechanical problems, all sorts of uh, issues. So you want to keep that flexible. Arch support and custom orthotics may help uh, slow the progression. Uh, genetics here, so even if you do everything right, unfortunately, if grandma had bunions, you might be looking at uh, her same feet on you in a few years, okay? Um, hammer toe deformities. So this is a deformity of the lesser toes. We saw uh, pictures of that in the other slide. It's the contracture bending, uh, if you will, of the small toes, so the second, third, fourth, or fifth toes, all of them, or uh, one or two. And this is again caused by an imbalance and out of sync situation between the tendons and ligaments uh, surrounding those little toe joints, okay? Toes can rub in shoes, resulting in corns and calluses, which you can even develop an open sore. So I keep referencing other, other conditions here. Uh, sometimes the foot is the first place where uh, certain medical conditions show up. So a diabetic patient losing sensation, et cetera, not being able to have that protective sensation can develop such sores with excessive shoe gear and gait pressure. Okay. Um, again, uh, like bunions, this is seen more commonly in women than men. That's again, because of the osseous structures of women compared to men. Here's a cartoon showing what a hammer toe is. So it shows that contracture at the ball of the foot joint, the metatarsophalangeal joint, as well as the interphalangeal joints. Now, if we want to um, get ready for the next round of Jeopardy, uh, and look at foot anatomy and foot conditions, we can even unpack this further. So this is a hammer toe. A mallet toe is a condition where just the end of the toe joint there is curled down. So think about a, a mallet, all right, being curled down where the other joints are more straight. Now, a claw toe is the third variation of this. I don't have cartoons of these, but a claw toe, think about a, a bird's claw or a reptile's claw, if you will. That's where you have contracture of the uh, distal joint and the middle joint, and to a, a different extent, that, that proximal joint in which you have a situation where you have a C shape uh, in the toe. All of these are variations of imbalance between the tendons and the ligaments that uh, work the toe joints. And this is what uh, hammer toes look like. Again, a condition where you can have crossing over, uh, where that joint capsule may be completely atrophied or ruptured. So the inability uh, for that toe to straighten on its own uh, is uh, slim uh, to none during a normal gait cycle. So when we're talking about treatment, shoe gear and activity modification, if we're not talking about surgery, uh, padding options, you see all sorts of things out there in the form of hammer toe pads. Uh, we advocate against medicated pads because such medicated pads have acid, which in someone without any health conditions, it's a, not a significant concern, but folks that have lack of sensation, circulatory compromise, et cetera, immune deficits, that small a uh, bit of uh, acid can cause the skin to break open, which results in other problems. Uh, shortly after my residency, a little antidote here, I, I trained in Pittsburgh. And at the time, that was a big uh, hub for US Air. And I had several uh, stewardess patients and steward patients 
um, U.S. Air in particular, I remember. Um, anyway, I, I had young, healthy uh, female patients uh, in their 20s. I had to wear what they need to wear and got overzealous using medicated uh, corn pads, which resulted in a macerated uh, ulceration, a sore that became uh, secondarily infected. So then we have uh, this mess here, if you will. So that's my, um, my rant about medicated uh, corn pads. Uh, for inflamed hammer toes, uh, it's a form of early arthritis, if you will, so anti-inflammatories, pain cream, et cetera. Uh, if uh, you have corns and calluses, we call this palliative care at the hands of a healthcare professional. That's reducing thickened skin as a result of shoe gear pressure and foot mechanics. Of course, in the aesthetic space, uh, estheticians can do this, but they're limited as to what their license will allow them to do uh, legally. Uh, surgery is, again, the only way to really uh, put these toes back in alignment. So here's some non-medicated hammer toe pads. The uh, pad in the middle, um, we can't really appreciate it on the photograph, but it's kind of like an upside down um, comma shaped pad. And what that does, that buttresses the contracted joints to cause the toe, um, to allow the toe to straighten. Uh, silicone toe sleeves, little socks for your toes are certainly uh, helpful, uh, as well as non-medicated adhesive pads. But Again, uh, adhesives sometimes can be a, a bit caustic, uh, can be a little bit irritating. So all that um, in uh, moderation. Here's some example hammer toe surgeries, a, a fairly straightforward, uh, simple operation. No operation is simple, but uh, in this case, what we do is essentially create a new joint in which that knuckle of the toe is uh, reduced and uh, trimmed back allowing that contracture to straighten and then pinned in place either temporarily or permanently. So uh, in orthopedics, there's two types of fixation. We say external fixation in the forms of pins or for more significant cases, frames, which is beyond our talk today, where a frame is actually consult, uh, constructed, constructed around a body part um, or internal uh, screw type uh, two-piece uh, implants to help keep bones together. Okay, uh, so we have internal fixation and external fixation, a couple ways to do uh, orthopedic uh, surgery. So this is some combination procedures. I uh, referenced uh, internal hardware. You can appreciate how uh, this sort of double-ended screw can keep that joint in alignment, uh, both on the left and right pictures. The central picture shows a different type of bunion surgery. Uh, in combination with uh, hammer toe surgery in which those pins are, um, for lack of a better term, skewered through the toe temporarily and come out in a, in a couple of weeks. This is again another variation. So I referenced there's many, many ways to, to fix a bunion deformity. This is a, a bunion deformity that was uh, more pronounced and the fixation technique is what's known as a proximal procedure. So you're operating on the base of that first metatarsal. You're swinging everything over. This particular technique is a variation of something called a lapidus bunionectomy, a uh, procedure that's tried and true and very stable. Uh, if you're a patient in your 20s or your 30s, this foot needs to be straight for the next uh, 60, 70 years, right? So uh, recurrence for more uh, definitive procedure is certainly lower uh, with this type of surgery, uh, as you might expect, is more involved. So um, the uh, fixation uh, needs to be robust and the time off uh, the foot needs to be significant. So procedures like this is, are usually six to eight weeks of non-weight bearing. Again, another variation of that lapidus type procedure on the right. Sometimes we even need to correct the uh, phalanx toe um, the proximal phalanx of the great toe joint, which you need to swing that over because you simply don't have enough uh, work uh, at your hands to do everything just operating on that metatarsal. So these are um, not the easiest surgeries to perform and uh, bragging about my foot and ankle partners at OrthoNeuro, we do a, a very excellent job um, uh, at this sort of work. Uh, sometimes we'll get patients that have had bun bunion surgery and recurrence can happen and doing revisional work is, is certainly complex and 
hats off to uh, my surgical partners uh, at ortho neuro. So again, um, this sort of uh, surgery, uh, showing that proximal bunion technique before and after pictures. Okay, uh, hammer toes, again, uh, prevention, right uh, size shoes, good quality, avoid uh, excessively tight toe boxes, high heels, et cetera, and genetics, just like we talk about bunion prevention, hammer toe prevention, uh, similar uh, type of um, uh, modalities prevent uh, this from taking place. Okay, moving on, uh, those conditions we just talked about are sort of a variation of arthritic change. So arthritis, uh, we talk about two broad categories. We have non-inflammatory and inflammatory arthritis. Non-inflammatory is degenerative joint disease or wear and tear. All of us will have some degree of arthritis if we walk this planet long enough. Joints wear out, uh, joints may be replaced, joints may be remodeled, but it's a reality uh, that will all be uh, fortunate enough to have if uh, we uh, age uh, gracefully. Um, inflammatory arthritis, the second variant, um, is uh, a, an immune response for genetic predilection, if you will, in which the body sort of attacks itself uh, beyond the scope of this discussion. But some examples of uh, rheumatologic conditions, we say body uh, humors in the old school fashion of inflammatory changes. Rheumatoid arthritis is a form of inflammatory um, arthritis, gout, uh, scleroderma, ankylosing spondylitis. But we have to control that inflammation. There's, there's a lot of subsets, uh, more than 100 of all of this that we see. Uh, juvenile type of inflammatory arthritis, uh, as well as arthritis that happens in the inflammatory, um, uh, of the inflammatory type, um, older women predispose, predisposed middle-aged women, older gentlemen, et cetera. Okay. So we probably all have an idea of what arthritis is and uh, what it looks like and how it, uh, how it may feel if we don't have it or talking to relatives, joint pain, joint stiffness, joint swelling, uh, deformity, okay, foot joints most commonly affected, affected great toe joints, uh, the ankle and the middle of the foot, the midfoot joints. This might look similar to what we were just talking about, bunions and hammer toes. This is arthritic change, okay, in which case you might have a completely straight architectural great toe joint, but you have this enlargening of the uh, metatarsal bone at that great toe joint in which bony overgrowth uh, is seen, okay? So that is a condition called hallux limitus in which that big toe, uh, the, the term for big toe in, in Latin is hallux limitus is simply limitation. We say hallux rigidus if we have lack of motion and we have a rigid toe joint. What's interesting about this, certainly you might appreciate this is painful, uh, early on, uh, as things progress, left untreated, that joint may in fact fuse itself and it becomes less painful, but certainly more problematic uh, to fit in shoe gear. And with respect to engaging in activities, what will happen is you'll get compensation, which the toe joint uh, more distally, that interphalangeal joint, which is a joint beyond the ball of the foot joint, if you will, that will become more flexible. And that's a compensation uh, type of mechanism. There's a surgery that we're going to reference uh, as we move along, uh, in which case uh, that compensation is actually favored. I'll explain that. Okay. So you can see on the photograph, on the radiograph on the left hand side of the screen, normal lesser toe joints, little toe joints there, very healthy, very normal. That great toe joint completely obliterated. All right. Lack of motion, no cartilage in which that, that. Uh, proximal phalanx, that phalanx bone, that first bone that makes up the big toe, completely bulldozes uh, and plows into that metatarsal head uh, over time. The middle radiograph shows that bony overgrowth, that bone spur, um, in which case that uh, limitation of range of motion is an issue. So uh, surgery for early stage, uh, both at my hands and my partner's, involves just simply cleaning up that toe joint, 
uh, which can be quite uh, efficacious early on, certainly may not last forever, but uh, a relatively uninvolved procedure. Uh, we'll, we'll reference some other more advanced type procedures as we move along here for arthritis. There's an arthritic ankle joint, okay, that a larger, uh, it's uh, that radiograph on the, on the right hand side there, that larger bone is the tibia and the smaller bone is the fibula. They make up the ankle bone uh, joint at top. Uh, the middle bone, if you make a fist, uh, and you look at your fist, that crazy bone that's kind of odd shaped, that's called the talus, that, that kind of resembles your fist. And that's completely um, cartilaginous, if you will, cartilage, that, um, that dome, that's uh, uh, your, your very uh, impressive, amazing ankle joint that helps propel you throughout your day. So you'd appreciate if you have lack of motion, how that's just going to disrupt everything there. Okay, so treating arthritis, again, we uh, reference accommodating a, an enlarged great toe joint, et cetera. So shoe gear modification, orthotics to uh, help if you have a painful great toe joint. Um, I'll reference uh, something we do with orthotics here in a minute. Uh, if you have an inflammatory type of arthritis, controlling that underlying disease process is paramount to prevent joint damage. So um, with gout, taking your gout medicine, certain foods can be potentiating for a gout attack, um, avoiding those, et cetera. Uh, Anti-inflammatories and or acetaminophen, uh, which would control pain, but not uh, inflammation for patients that can take anti-inflammatories. Uh, pain creams topically can be of some benefit, steroid injections, and of course, surgery. Um, I referenced orthotics and uh, something that can be done. Let's say we have uh, a situation in which that great toe joint has lack of motion and is painful uh, to move. Uh, the orthotic, which is a custom-made device, we do a lot of these at OrthoNeuro, uh, that custom device has this finger-like projection under the great toe joint that acts as like a lever, if you will. So when you step, that great toe joint isn't moving up and down but you're able to protect it and still able to walk with such a device and shoe gear. We call that a Morton's extension or just simply um, a first ray extension. Uh, arthritis surgery, lots of options here. So this shows an example of a joint replacement, a partial joint replacement. Now, this is an evolving technology, just like ankle joint replacement is an evolving technology. There's lots of literature to support both ankle joint replacement and great toe joint replacement. Uh, if we had grand rounds with my orthopedic colleagues, we would all fight about what doesn't work, what works the best, what is uh, horrible, um, et cetera. But um, such things uh, are available. And in my hands, uh, practicing 20 years, such a partial joint replacement is in fact a viable option uh, that the literature will support. Also equally viable and arguably long-term uh, better results is a joint fusion that I'm gonna reference here uh, in a minute that shows how we can actually fuse this joint in the great toe and have compensation at that end joint in the big toe where biomechanically, you're still able to live a very productive, uh, active life. Okay, so this is the surgery I referenced on the left, a partial joint replacement. Uh, and on the right is a joint fusion. Uh, there's many ways to do this with plates, with screws, et cetera. So you might appreciate that if that joint doesn't move, the joint distal to it uh, certainly uh, has motion available to it. So when we do this sort of surgery, there's a particular position that joint needs to be in so that the uh, uh, kind of happy medium results where the first ray, if you will, which are uh, the metatarsal and the toe bones are in a position in which the body can uh, propel itself off of that first ray. So as such, then the uh, distal joint, the one that's not fused on the right becomes more mobile. All right. And that almost mimics the range of motion that a great toe joint has. So this procedure on the right is tried and true in the orthopedic literature, uh, a very good procedure for more advanced cases. Now, not only do we fuse front of the foot, we fuse back of the foot. So this is a major fusion type of operation. Okay, uh, such things uh, again require uh, some time off the foot 
as you might expect. This shows the calcaneus, which is the heel bone into that, that talus bone, which is the bottom part of the ankle joint. We talked about making a fist. That's the shape of your talus bone, as well as uh, the rear foot joints there, the cuboid bone and the navicular bone and some other joints there. So this is for very advanced arthritic cases or uh, feet that are unstable. There's a diabetic condition called Charcot foot in which um, the instability uh, can be in fact limb threatening. So fusing uh, these joints in that uh, unstable insensate foot in the diabetic uh, certainly are, are necessary at times. This shows an example technique of an ankle fusion, uh, shows a, uh, what we call an intermedullary rod, a big dowel that goes from the bottom of the foot all the way up through uh, that large leg bone, the tibia, okay? So how do we prevent this? Well, uh, genetics, unfortunately, uh, can play a role here, but shoe gear awareness. So wearing properly fitting shoes, um, the right size, getting fitted correctly, um, are absolutely uh, necessary uh, because again, if we're going to walk this earth, earth four times, like I referenced early on, you have to have the right shoe gear uh, to take you on that journey. Uh, um, part of uh, what I do for our group, my, my blog is called A Step Ahead, and I talk about uh, athletic shoes. Uh, you can reference some of these articles uh, for good information. Uh, orthotics and controlling abnormal biomechanics to prevent the breakdown uh, in the first place. If you have that inflammatory uh, process, controlling that underlying inflammatory condition is very necessary. Uh, a bit controversial is medical foods, uh, shark cartilage, glucose, glucosamine, et cetera. Um, such things uh, are not necessarily harmful, but may not uh, be the most uh, beneficial, but uh, certainly, again, uh, medical nutrition is an evolving science, and uh, we're, we're making progress. Okay, topic five, moving on of our uh, top six things that can affect your feet uh, that um, I see regularly. Tendinitis is inflammation or irritation of a tendon resulting in pain, possibly weakness, Maybe that tendon uh, results in an instability sort of situation. If the tendon sheath is involved, the coating around the tendon, we say that that's tenosynovitis, okay? Uh, most often this is a result of overuse, but can be more related to an acute episode. So think about your weekend warrior that's uh, training for pelotonia or a marathon and they hit it really hard and then you have an acute inflammatory process that gets out of control uh, early on. And the foot and ankle, uh, most common tendons involved are that Achilles tendon, which happens to be the strongest tendon in the body, okay, that propels our feet, uh, as well as the posterior tibial tendon. Uh, that's uh, the tendon that helps create the arch, all right, helps that Achilles tendon work. On the outside of the ankle, not as common, but also seen uh, with frequency is the perineal tendon group. So the posterior tibial tendon helps the foot um, move sort of down and in the Achilles tendon in a roundabout way, or I, I'm sorry, the perineal tendon in a roundabout way helps stabilize the foot to move sort of up and out. So all this has to work in concert uh, to have that uh, normal, normal gait, if you will. And if we remember physics uh, from high school or depending on what you do in life, uh, physics, um, when we study vectors, they have force and direction. So if a tendon is pulling abnormally, abnormal force and abnormal direction, that can cause this overuse. A little bit of anatomy here. So in the back there, you can see the Achilles tendon, all right? The uh, middle of the foot tendon, that posterior tibial tendon. And on the outside, you can't appreciate, uh, but that's the perineal tendon group. Now you also have tendons that work toes up, toes that work, uh, or tendons that work toes down. Now. Plantar fasciitis, a little teaser here, we will touch on that. That's a subset of this. Plantar fascia, exceedingly common to have a problem with. It's not exactly a tendon, but it's, we're lumping it into this discussion here shortly. Okay, so prevention and treatment, anti-inflammatories, if you have an inflammation process and or steroids, injections depending. We typically don't inject 
the Achilles tendon. We don't want to uh, weaken an already compromised Achilles tendon being the strongest tendon in the body. Uh, steroids sometimes can weaken such that uh, you can have tendon ruptures, et cetera. Not very common, but a talking point where you can uh, certainly compromise an RA disease tendon. Uh, sugar and activity modification, immobilizing depending on the severity. So everybody I'm sure sees uh, folks walking around in walking boot appliances at the grocery store, et cetera. Uh, we call that protective mobilization, if you will. So walking, uh, still being able to uh, move along um, while you're able to get on with your uh, activities of daily living to some extent. Controlling abnormal biomechanics, possibly orthotics. So uh, an underlying theme here with these musculoskeletal problems is biomechanics, and that is how bones, ligaments, and joints move in concert. And if something's off a bit, especially in the foot, how often we're using our foot joints, how often we're walking, how often we're moving, that can really accelerate such processes. Uh, if you have a diseased tendon that's diseased enough, certainly repair is necessary. Tendon transfers, uh, a bit beyond the discussion. Of, uh, of today, but uh, you can actually move tendons around to take uh, the job of other tendons that are weak, pretty advanced type uh, procedures um, if frontline treatment doesn't work. So uh, we uh, will move on to our little subset of tendonitis, exceedingly common, this condition called plantar fasciitis. All right, this is inflammation of the plantar fascia. All right, this I kind of uh, refer to as the appendix of the foot, if you will. It's a little bit more important than that, but the plantar fascia is this ligament that goes from the heel bone, fans out into the toes, and it pre, it pre, uh, it's kind of a, uh, an intermediary layer between muscles, tendons, nerves, and uh, other ligaments, as well as, uh, or uh, between fatty tissue. So you have fatty tissue and skin, then you have this plantar fascia, and then you have ligamentous structures, nerve structures, etc. And what happens is you can get abnormal pulling at that insertion where the uh, plantar fascia pulls on the heel. A telltale sign of this is pain with activities after periods of rest. So we say uh, this is post-static dyskinesia, post-static pain. So after you sleep at night, you wake up in the morning, you step on the floor and you feel this pulling, this pain, all right? That's because all that inflammatory soup uh, settles and uh, mixes around and after you uh, walk a bit, get going a little bit more, your body wakes up, that inflammation sort of circulates out. Uh, a flatter foot type is more predisposed to plantar fasciitis. This is insidious, meaning gradual, most often, but can be trauma related. Uh, again, think about that weekend warrior running for that marathon or training for that marathon, that excessive pounding can be uh, certainly significant. Other causes, shoes with lack of arch support, certain activities, type of job and uh, body weight, okay? So here's that plantar fascia. Again, uh, that ligament is uh, the in-between uh, tissue between the fat and uh, skin of the bottom of the foot. And underneath this plantar fascia is muscle layers, tendons, ligaments, and um, nerve structures, et cetera, okay? So you might appreciate if this pulls over time, it causes this inflammation, areas of micro tearing, and you might even develop the dreaded heel spur. Now, uh, the heel spur uh, is kind of a chicken or egg story. So this is a result of the problem, not the cause. So over time, pulling on this heel causes this inflammation to uh, create calcium deposition, ergo the heel spur. So it's not the cause, it's the result. So when we see x-rays of people with heel spurs, they may be completely asymptomatic versus a patient that has no heel spur that's miserable, that's uh, early on in their uh, plantar uh, fasciitis disease course. Uh, in my years of practice, what I have seen over time, uh, left untreated, you will get some bony overgrowth. This is theorized to possibly be a situation in which the uh, body is trying to shorten uh, the uh, plantar fascia so it's not pulling as much, okay? So treatment for this focusing uh, on breaking that inflammation cyclone and prevent it from coming back. So similar to our, our general tendonitis, anti-inflammatory steroid injections are a mainstay here because this again isn't a very crucial uh, structure in the foot. Uh, orthotics and night splints. Um, night splints help stretch the foot so you don't have things contract. 
uh, active stretching, physical therapy modalities, et cetera. So uh, one physical therapy modality is called iontophoresis or variation of phonophoresis in which topical steroid is driven into those tissues. There's something called extracorporeal shockwave therapy, um, kind of a scary name, but what it does, it essentially breaks up inflammation uh, it causes more of an acute injury that the body can recognize, if you will. This can be used for other tendonitis problems as well. So uh, Achilles tendonitis, uh, epicondylitis in the elbow, uh, very common um, to see this uh, treatment for plantar fasciitis, although not the most common procedure, certainly a, a go-to thing we can do that avoids surgery uh, that we do at orthoneuro. Uh, now surgery, uh, plantar fasciotomy is a term to release the ligament and or in a concert with maybe addressing that a tight Achilles. So a lot of foot biomechanics are related to a tight Achilles. So simply helping relax that tight Achilles, uh, surgery when warranted can help correct this plantar fascia. This is again, um, a whole school of uh, biomechanics that uh, is beyond our talk, but know that um, things um, are out there uh, that um, uh, can correct these biomechanical flaws, and you don't have to go on dealing with something that's not working properly. This is uh, extracorporeal shockwave therapy. We visualize the plantar fascia and deliver this high energy ultrasound. This is an office procedure that I do. Okay. This is an example of uh, one treatment in which you're releasing the plantar fascia. This shows a scope procedure. This can be done with a slightly larger incision. This can be done in, in concert with lengthening that Achilles. Uh, the uh, Achilles terminates from the calf muscle. We say the gastrocnemius muscle. There's two heads of that. And then down below, even further, there's a muscle called the soleus muscle. Think of like a soulfish, a flat uh, muscle. Those uh, two muscles, one of which is in two parts, uh, terminate into the Achilles tendon. So there's a procedure called a gastroc recession. There's a procedure called a tendo Achilles lengthening, where you're operating above this plantar fascia to give you more flexibility. This is a tried and true orthopedic uh, procedure that we do at OrthoNeuro. Okay, so prevention, supportive shoe gear and orthotics, activity modification as necessary, stretching, maintaining your correct weight, et cetera. Okay, wrapping up, uh, number six here is nerve problems. Huge topic. We're going to discuss kind of two broad categories. We have entrapment syndromes. Tarsal tunnel is like carpal tunnel in the foot and ankle. Uh, carpal tunnel is a condition in which the median nerve gets compressed uh, in the uh, wrist. The uh, tarsal tunnel condition in which the tibial nerve uh, behind the ankle gets compressed in that carpal tunnel in the ankle, okay? Morton's neuroma is another type of entrapment syndrome or nerve inflammation process. There's a, a nerve branch that's behind the toes that ultimately gives rise to smaller nerves. In fact, that's really how our nerve system is put together. It's like a big circuit board. So larger nerves give rise to smaller nerves, okay? Uh, Morton's neuroma is an entrapment syndrome, some theorize, or an inflammation of the nerve. Think about a cable coming out from your wall. The copper wire is the nerve tissue and the insulation is uh, exactly that, the insulation around the nerve tissue. That's the part that gets inflamed. So you have entrapment syndromes and you have peripheral neuropathy. This is a condition that diffusely affects nerves, most commonly seen as a result of uncontrolled long-withstanding diabetes. Uh, pain uh, eventually, uh, and unfortunately, if unchecked, uh, pain gives rise to anesthesia, which is lack of sensation. So uh, lack of sensation certainly sets up uh, an insensate foot to trauma that wouldn't be realized otherwise. Other causes of peripheral neuropathy, chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy, side effect of certain metabolic conditions, uh, certain underlying things such as vitamin B12 and thyroid problems. So a little nerve anatomy here, that's that tibial nerve. We say posterior tibial nerve, which is a bit of a misnomer. There isn't an anterior tibial nerve but this is that large nerve behind the ankle and then those, those uh, digital nerves giving rise to nerves in the toes in which that Morton's neuroma condition can happen. So uh, prevention and treatment, all right? Anti-inflammatories, again, steroids can help. 
Uh, steroid injections can help, topical pain creams possibly. Uh, again, I'll reference controlling biomechanics, shoe gear and activity modification, et cetera. Surgery for this problem for uh, entrapment syndromes, uh, for tarsal tunnel, just like uh, carpal tunnel, we're releasing the soft tissues uh, around the nerve to um, eliminate pressure. Morton's neuroma, since such nerves aren't uh, very large, just simply excising that nerve tissue can be done. Uh, surgery that I do and have done for many years, if all things fail. Um, you are left with a little bit of numbness between toes, but you have sensation uh, around uh, the outside of the toe. So all that pain, if we're not getting any success, this is a very successful uh, non-life alterating uh, for the negative, if you will, uh, procedure. Um, life altering, alt, um, life altering for the positive. Okay. So when we talk about neuropathy prevention and treatment, um, if there is an underlying cause controlling that underlying cause is paramount in particular diabetes. Okay. Uh, keeping that blood sugar, uh, as close to normal as possible, um, controlling medication side effects. So, uh, chemotherapy certainly is necessary, uh, many times, uh, with cancer patients, uh, this is a side effect that can reverse itself once they're off their chemotherapy reagents, um, changing around uh, medication regimen, et cetera, can be of help. And the medications to treat specific nerve pain, gabapentin is a gener generic name for a neurotin, uh, tricyclic antidepressants, not just for depression, but for nerve problems. So uh, I reference, it's very important to address these um, neuropathic conditions early before nerve damage results. We simply cannot at this stage regrow uh, peripheral nerves. Someday maybe, but now we can't. So when you have complete uh, numb extremities, you can't get that back. Okay, so a little wrap up here. Common sense, hygiene and nail care. We referenced some of this early uh, in our talk, avoiding going barefoot excessively in public places, trimming your toenails more straight across, pedicure awareness, if you will. Uh, shoe and sock health, not just foot health, uh, well-made, properly fitting shoes. Um, a little caveat here, the rule of thumb when we're talking about shoe size is exactly that. You want about a thumb's nail width from your longest toe to the end of uh, the shoe and getting fit for shoes at the end of the day uh, as our feet are in dependency, if you will. Um, they tend to be a little bit more swollen. So you want to be able to accommodate that foot that's a little bit on the larger size as uh, your day fluctuates, your feet will fluctuate just a little bit. Keeping feet active and flexible, exercise certainly important. Inspecting your feet, uh, not just uh, disregarding them, especially if you have underlying conditions and promptly addressing these foot problems before they get out of control. Okay, well, I certainly appreciate your time tonight. Um, uh, we, uh, we will certainly be able to do a question and answer uh, session. So I see we already have several here. Um, what exactly is it about pedicures that can cause foot issues? So that's an excellent question. Um, with respect to pedicures in and of themselves, they're certainly a nice thing to do. Um, it's a hygiene thing. So um, I referenced uh, estheticians must adhere to the State Board of Cosmetology, which is under the State Medical Board. Certain practices need to be carried out, which is the overwhelming majority of spas. Um, if you're a patient with an immunocompromise or uh, something like that, uh, where your immune system isn't working very well, if you're doing a, uh, a spa pedicure, okay, uh, they can sanitize, but it's not uh, to the extent that we uh, sterilize surgical instruments. Now, such uh, instrumentation must be sterilized and autoclaved if it's going to be reused, but you simply can't sterilize a whirlpool. So um, it, the likelihood that you would contract something is uh, certainly low, but I will tell you I've had patients come in that have had issues after they have had a pedicure uh, for the first time, um, and uh, something happens, such as a fungal infection, an athlete's foot, etc. So um, many, many reputable salons and spas are out there, and uh, it's just a matter of being aware, okay? If something doesn't look right, feel right to you, 
uh, it may not be. So moving on, how likely is it to get a foot fungus from a nail salon? Kind of just reference that uh, low, if you will. But um, if we're talking about volumes of people, um, it's just part of uh, the nature of things, okay? Um, again, uh, certainly a, a nice practice to undergo. Um, in my field, you can have what we call a medical pedicure. And this is something that uh, podiatrists do, insurances pay for. Um, we don't do the aesthetic piece, but someone that's elderly that has difficulty trimming their nails, this is something that podiatrists do with uh, frequency. Also by scope of practice, an esthetician can't uh, perform uh, surgical procedures, which I, I'm thinking everybody would agree would, would be obvious, such as an ingrown toenail, removing that. Um, it can't be uh, done uh, to the extent that a physician can. So hopefully I answered that question. Is it possible to permanently get rid of toenail fungus without going into a pedicure? Is there any topical treatments that will work? Okay, let me read this again. Is it possible to permanently get rid of toenail fungus without going into a procedure. Oh, okay. I gotcha. Um, not sure that I'm understanding, but the question might be if you're undergoing maybe a, a different surgical procedure, um, and you might be worried about spreading nail fungus to other parts of your body. Um, certainly we can get rid of fungus, um, both nail fungus, fingers and toes, as well as, um, skin fungus. Um, if you're a person that's immunocompromised or underlying conditions or on medications that uh, put a chink in your immune system per se, that uh, sets you up for uh, a more opportunistic infection with a fungus. So that might be more difficult to get rid of. Um, totally clearing a long withstanding nail fungus, the longer you have this, the more difficult it can be. So again, early prevention, all right? So hopefully I answered that question. So bottom line, um, with respect to nail fungus and going into a surgical procedure, uh, usually this is not of concern. Uh, active bacterial infections, open wounds, depending on the type of surgery that you're having is certainly a talking point for your surgeon. Um, and with this other person's uh, question, is there any topical treatments that will work? I will say yes. Topical treatments have shown a significant clinical benefit over the past several years. Newer trade names include Jublia and Keratin. An older one is called Penlac or Cyclopyrox. Keep in mind though, uh, these topicals need to penetrate that hard uh, keratin-like plate that is the nail itself. So having uh, medicine penetrate that is not an easy task. There's combination treatments, um, with topicals to help soften the nail. Uh, I didn't mention that, but that's something that uh, can be done. Medicines that help soften that hard, thickened nail plate itself, and then the antifungal can work better. Uh, I will reference laser in concert with topicals, laser by itself, topicals by itself, oral antifungals by themselves. All of these things can have benefit, but doing these things synergistically uh, have a significant uh, benefit. Uh, laser um, is heat and light energy. I referenced this earlier. Um, there's no side effects. And this is something that has really uh, shown to be quite beneficial over the years. With my patients that are laser patients um, at OrthoNeuro, I highly recommend doing something topically in addition to um, the laser. It's that synergistic approach. Moving on, um, are you more likely to get athlete's foot if you are diabetic? So the short answer is yes, um, especially if you're uncontrolled, okay? We like that hemoglobin A1C uh, below eight for wound healing. Um, I referenced um, uh, my, my specialty and, and Heather, um, uh, again, many thanks for that gracious introduction. I'm a wound care specialist and 20% of what uh, my practice involves is, is advanced wound care, both in our office and wound centers affiliated both with Mount Carmel and Ohio Health. So um, when we say wound healing, okay, in the diabetic, we like that hemoglobin A1C, which is the long-term sugar control number. We like that below eight. So if your uh, sugar control is not that, if it's not controlled, you're um, at risk for um, infections, uh, not just bacterial, but fungal. So not to say that you can't get rid of such things if you are diabetic, but the best 
uh, way to treat athlete's foot is to prevent it uh, from happening in the first place. Are the nails on your hands different than the nails on your feet? Is it possible to get an ingrown nail on the hands? This is a very good question. Um, they grow a little bit uh, slower on the foot uh, or on the toes, but essentially the anatomy is the same. Now, they're um, exposed to more significant uh, traumatic situations in which the toenails being locked in shoes or just walking can be disposed uh, more to an ingrown problem. On occasion, I'll see an ingrown fingernail. On occasion, I'll see a fingernail with fungus, all right, but more likely to see such things um, in, the, in the toenails. So short answer, essentially it's the same uh, anatomy for the most part, but what it's attached to, which is related to what a fingernail is or a toenail is, is a little different. Okay, next question. Does the ingrown toenail ever grow back if permanently re removed? Great question. We have probably a three to 5% recurrence rate when we do an ingrown toenail surgery. Most commonly in my hands, we do the uh, phenol matricectomy. Um, if it grows back, it may not grow back as bad. Uh, we can always redo it again. And if so, it's exceedingly rare then it'll grow back after a second time. Now, we'll say in my practice, um, doing this for many years, I have a couple patients I can probably count on one hand in which that phenol technique is just not effective. Uh, we've done the surgical technique, which just involves stitching and, and more, more of a deeper surgical uh, excision. Um, that uh, also exceedingly rare for an ingrown toenail or fingernail for that matter to come back, but it can, it can happen. Very uncommon, in which case it's just redone. Next question, when do you recommend surgery for bunions? So this is an outstanding question. Uh, the three foot specialists at OrthoNeuro um, would probably discuss similarly here, but uh, certainly um, when you're a uh, Uh, most symptomatic is too late. Okay. So as your, uh, your bunions do not hurt. Okay. We can uh, hopefully um, prevent progression. And um, I'm wondering if I lost my connection. I'm sorry if I did. Um, maybe I did. I'll just keep talking. Um, You're still on. Am I still on? Okay, very good. Okay, maybe my screenshot might be uh, static, which is okay. Um, so anyway, um, regarding uh, surgery, um, a discussion early on is certainly helpful uh, with a surgeon. So uh, when you're starting to notice symptoms, uh, when you're having shoe gear uh, difficulty, all of those um, uh, are red flags that you should get uh, looked at. Then certainly it's up to you, your lifestyle, your realistic expectations. Again, I referenced um, there's many ways to fix a bunion. So um, personally, um, when you notice this, is at least get an evaluation, get an informed uh, an opinion from a foot and ankle specialist, and um, they can let you know um, where things stand uh, currently. Okay. Um, next question. How do I stretch my heel cords? Okay. Um, everybody seems to have an aunt or a cousin that has a TheraBand, um, one of those stretchy rubber band type things. Uh, it's a simple exercise. You want to put that in the front part of your foot, raise your toes to your nose, if you will, and hold that. All right. Um, a runner stretch is something in which you place your heel down on the floor and you lean forward. Uh, such things are maybe more easily visualized than described, um, but uh, that's another uh, way to stretch. Uh, stretching frequently is a good thing to do, being limber. Um, yoga is an excellent activity. Uh, if you're a runner, you know the importance of stretching before and cooling down and stretching after a run, uh, et cetera. So those are two ways to stretch your heel cords. The runner stretch, keeping your uh, heel on the bottom of the floor, on, on the ground and, and leaning in, as well as that TheraBand um, uh, uh, technique with that rubber, uh, rubberized uh, stretchy band. Also a bath towel works too. Um, next question, what's the difference between a hammer toe and a claw toe? Very good question. Uh, we covered this. So a hammer toe is where the toe sticks up, if you will, and the two joints 
um, are more straight. So that knuckle beyond the ball of the foot sticks up a claw toe. Think of a bird's claw or a reptile's claw, which those two little joints in the toe curl down. Okay. So um, that uh, is a different sort of weight bearing pressure problem than a hammer toe. Okay. Okay. Um, which bunion surgeries do I perform? That is an excellent question. So I'm going to talk globally. Um, as our foot and ankle group, the three surgeons, we perform all types, okay? Um, not to get out of your question, um, but uh, depending on the severity, de depending on the patient's age, depending on how the bone stock is. Remember, we have to move bone over and uh, surgically fix um, where that bone is and where that bone is translated and moved over. So if you have poor bone stock, something called osteoporosis or osteopenia, that's not going to hold your fixation very well. So uh, earlier on, about a middle of the talk, we, sh we showed radiographs where bunion surgery was performed more towards the, the, uh, the big toe itself. We showed bunion surgery where it was performed more proximally, if you will. So the more significant the deformity, the more aggressive the surgical procedure needs to be, the more robust the fixation needs to be. So uh, bottom line, uh, your specialist here at OrthoNeuro would pick the right procedure for you, okay? Um, hopefully that helps, um, but that's a uh, pretty significant question. Uh, can you fix toe arthritis? Sure. We referenced either partial joint replacement or arthrodesis, which is fusing that great toe joint. It might again sound scary to fuse that great toe joint, but um, what happens is the end of the toe joint um, uh, becomes more flexible and you're able to um, uh, have a, sig uh, a significantly more normal gait than you might uh, not expect. The trick with that, again, is to fuse that great toe joint in the right position to have the right uh, split the difference lever arm, if you will. So that's uh, how we fix toe arthritis more um, uh, definitively. There's a condition called a chylectomy where we can simply remodel the toe joint for early stage arthritis to allow that base of the proximal phalanx, if you will, to ride over top of uh, that metatarsal joint or the metatarsal bone. Uh, so that, that's another way we can uh, help restore motion, if you will. What is the best medicine for gout? Another question here, another good question. So there's preventive medicine and there's, um, there's medicine to treat gout acutely. So um, gout patients, if they're having just an episode or two a year, you may think twice about going on a preventive medicine, may not be necessary, something you can sort out with your internist or a rheumatologist or specialist, um, such as a foot and ankle physician that treats this. Um, medicines to prevent the gouty attack in the first place, if you tend to have more frequent attacks, are different than acute medicines. So the, again, gout is an inflammatory arthritis. Medicines that are um, designed to treat inflammation, steroids, etc. There's medicines to disrupt the gout metabolism itself. So gout is the body's inability to break down certain uh, products of food, Okay, purines and pyrimidines, uric acid is a byproduct of that. Uh, we used to get more uh, specific about whether you produce too much uric acid, you're an overproducer, or you don't get rid of it well enough, you're an under excreter. There's medicines to address all of that. Now it's uh, more broadly looked upon as um, if you have more frequent attacks, medicines to prevent gout. Um, Euloric is one. Uh, medicine. Uh, I'll reference, there's several others. Uh, then there's your acute medicines, colchicine, steroids, etc. Okay, hopefully that helped there. A um, couple more questions. Um, how common is neuropathy in diabetics? Well, um, early on, okay, if you're controlling your diabetes, what I have seen in my practice his patients can be uh, completely um, free of this condition well into their disease process, okay? So controlling your diabetes is by far and away uh, the best way uh, to prevent your neuropathy. Now, I'm gonna tie neuropathy and diabetes and control all together. In uncontrolled diabetes, 
It's very common. And sadly, I see a fair amount of neuropathy in patients, both the painful kind and unfortunately the anesthetic kind, the non-painful kind, more often than I would like. So I, I, I have to say it's common enough in my practice, ergo related to the uncontrolled diabetes. Now, it can happen to, uh, as best as you take care of yourself, unfortunately, you can develop neuropathic conditions if you're a diabetic, but by far and away, their uh, neuropathy is seen um, most commonly in uncontrolled diabetics. Okay. Uh, hopefully I didn't confuse you there. Um, someone here, I have two more questions here. Um, not a top six issue, but what do you recommend for the treatment and prevention of foot toe calluses? Okay. Very good question. So kind of related to our hammer toe and claw toe, mallet toe discussion. Um, treatment. Uh, is palliation in which that callus is uh, trimmed down, smoothed down professionally, um, or in the aesthetic space, estheticians can do this to some degree, but not to the extent as a licensed physician. So creating uh, or, or, or debriding, if you will, paring down, all these are terms to get rid of thickened skin. The body and its magic, instead of creating an open sore, you're layering up thickened skin over a bony prominence. So you don't create an open sore. So keeping that skin smooth by uh, professional care, or even at home palliation, you can use a, uh, an emery board that's a little bit larger or um, a foot file, if you will. I'm not a big fan of metallic things. Uh, anything that looks like a cheese grater, I would not advocate using on your foot. Um, mechanical things we use professionally to help you know, uh, smooth down thickened skin. Uh, padding, again, I referenced non-medicated pads, medicated pads, although not harmful to everyone, certainly have the predisposition to be harmful to patients that have a lack of sensation um, in their feet. Um, you can induce a chemical burn, et cetera. So any, any non-medicated pads that we showed earlier in the talk certainly uh, could be uh, uh, used. Uh, little sock pads for your toes, and of course, shoe gear modification. So if you have that pair of shoes that's just rubbing one particular toe, uh, you can look at getting the toe box stretched uh, by a cobbler or simply retiring those shoes. Okay, and I think we have two more questions here. Um, this person, just a comment. Thank you for this presentation. It's good to know we are not alone with any of these problems and that there is something we can do about them to better our quality of life. Well, that's very much appreciated. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and last question, how many time for laser treatments to treat nail fungus infections? So that's a, that's a very good question. The particular laser device we have at OrthoNeuro um, to treat nail fungus is six treatments in which case you come in uh, for initial consultation and we discuss uh, what your problem is. Some, some nail conditions may look like nail fungus and they are not nail fungus. So we uh, discuss um, your condition. And if you're a candidate for nail fungus and you come back once a month uh, for a short treatment that uh, is not painful, there's no um, anesthesia that's necessary. I will say uh, the laser causes um, the nail to get a little bit warm, so it can get slightly uncomfortable, but certainly um, nothing that requires uh, anesthesia. So in, um, in my hands for the particular laser device, we have it six treatments, okay? Um, I would suggest anybody that would be interested, we would arrange a consult first to go into details. It's a bit beyond our our scope tonight. So um, I think that went through all of our questions. Uh, certainly appreciate uh, all the feedback. Hopefully this was, was helpful. Uh, many thanks for your time spending it with us uh, tonight and uh, do right by your feet. Uh, they'll take you to good places. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Napolitano. Thank you for participating in tonight's webinar. Our next webinar will be held on September 1st. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Good night.